Hi everyone. Um, nice to see you again. Uh, this is our final NLP seminar for the semester. Today we have Jun Jae Hu talking about his work. Uh, he's, he's a final year PhD student at CMU working with Professor Jamie Carpenel and Professor Grav Newbig. And he'll be talking about uh, his work on trading robust AIs and multilingual grounded language learning and reasoning in human human and human machine communication. Welcome, Junche, and I hand over to you. Yeah, yeah. have a good talk. So, yeah, thank you for Marika's uh, introduction. So, and hello everyone, I'm Junche from Carnegie Mellon. So today I'm going to present our series of work on cross-lingual generalization, alignment and application. So let's take a look at the past so why we care about cross-lingual NLP? Because uh, when we are talking about training mo models for cross-lingual machine learning tasks, we are actually interested in the context of transferring the knowledge across different languages. So typically from English to any other languages that you care about. And I also find this uh, context particularly useful to motivate us to think about several questions. For example, why we want to do cross-single NLP task and why it makes sense empirically and why our uh, NLP models are able to get good results in this context. I find this context particularly useful because we have more than 7,000 living languages in the world, but the vast majority of the data that we have are only annotated for English. Therefore, Building an LP system to support many languages involves some research on cross-lingual generalization ability. And luckily, we know that uh, many languages share some similar uh, structures like word order and also share similar word roots. So, for example, here we observe that an uh, English word that that and the German word H, is, uh, both of them come from a, Latin, a single Latin word. And we also find that some of the languages actually uh, share similar grammars, like for example, the English from now on, uh, when you compare with the Chinese phrase, and you can actually, even though you don't know uh, Chinese at all, based on the structure I highlighted here, you know that there are some similar patterns, for example, a preposition followed by a noun phrase and another, another phrase. So based on this cross-lingual similarities, some of the events in learning continuous representation over the last year has found that uh, the pre-training of such contextualized representation on lots, lots of many, uh, lots of languages can be helpful to transfer the knowledge across languages. So starting from 2017, Google proposed the multilingual um, translation models, and this model can be, can be used to translate a language from uh, one language to multiple languages or from multiple languages to a single language. And Starting from 2018, Google also proposed the multilingual bird, which is a pre-trained model on hundreds of languages on Wikipedia text. And this uh, pre-trained model actually provides a good initialization for a lot of NLP tasks. And later on, Facebook and Google also proposed a lot of other advanced uh, models trained on much larger data sets. For example, Facebook cross-single uh, language model and cross-single language model robota. So the talk of today, the talk today, we were focused on several questions. So despite all this success, we want to know the, uh, three, three questions. How can we evaluate the progress of cross-single NLP? And how can we improve the current models? And how can we apply this 
uh, state-of-the-art models to real-world applications. So the first part I would mainly focus on cross-single generalization evaluation. Um, so we know that uh, many of these uh, models work empirically, but we don't know how this model can be generalized to tasks or generalized to a variety of tasks or generalized across different languages. So, and we know that building the, having a better understanding of the performance across different tasks and across different languages can be helpful for us to design the next generation of the multilingual machine learning model. And let's take a look at how this model works in practice. So first of all, uh, we would like to have uh, uh, multilingual data, and this data is used to pre-train the system using a mass single language modeling objective. And later on, when we have a downstream application, we will have some English annotated data. And we want to apply this uh, model to, uh, we want to fine tune these models on the English annotated data and try to predict the correct label for the downstream task. And at the testing stage, we have some text in other languages, and we want to directly apply this model to predict the label for this text and come up with our prediction. So the idea here is that in the, in the pre-training stage on the left, the model gets a initial, good initialization by training on lots of monolingual data. And this data are actually and also at the sentence level. And this good generalization actually steers the weight in the transformer architecture so that some of the knowledge implicitly uh, can share their, uh, their similarity. For, uh, some of the language actually can be, uh, can be benefit from sharing such architectures. And to evaluate the cross-lingual generalization of the process that I mentioned about, we propose the extreme benchmark to evaluate the cross-lingual generalization ability. And the benchmark is also used to encourage the future research on new multilingual machine learning models. And with this purpose in mind, we carefully select four categories of tasks and 40 languages in our benchmark. These four categories of tasks include the sentence classification, structure prediction, sentence retrieval, and question answering. So a model is first pre-trained using monolingual data, and then later on will be fine-tuned on all these tasks. And then we were trying to come up with the prediction for all of these tasks and then get the final evaluation for them. And for all these tasks, I would try to briefly mention uh, a little bit on the setup here. For the sentence classification, we are actually doing the natural language inference uh, task. And it's actually a three task classification task uh, in uh, 15 languages. So it asks the model to predict whether two sentences are actually contradictory or neutral or enhance each other. And for the cross-lingual paraphrase task, it actually is a, it's, it's actually a binary classification task in seven languages. So we want to ask the model to predict whether a pair of sentences, a pair of sentences are actually paraphrased or not. And for the structure prediction task, we want to train the model on the annotation of English um, and annotated POS tag or name entity recognition tag. And we want to predict on the other, uh, are the other 33 language for the POS tagging and 40 language for the NER tagging. And 
for sentence retrieval, we uh, set up. For the first setup, we actually require the model to extract the parallel coppers from two unaligned monolingual texts. And the second task is to retrieve an English translation of a given sentence in the other 36 languages. And for question answering task, we basically adopt the similar uh, set up for what and by asking the model to predict a stand of words for answer um, and then uh, and also trying to, uh, to use this uh, model one of the model to train on the x graph to predict on the MLQA and also test on the IDQA task. So, uh, because well, we, we want to test the model's representation at different levels, so we need to carefully select our task based on the different strategies. So here is our selection criteria. So we want our task to be difficult enough so that there is a significant, significant gap between the human and model performance. And we also want our task to be as diverse as possible, so we can test the transfer representation at different levels. For example, at the token level, like uh, in POS tagging task, and at the sentence level for sentence classification task. And we also want to train the model as efficient as possible, so we, we also try to pick a fine-tuning task that can be trainable with the modern GPU within one day. And we also want our task to contain a lot of testing language as much as possible, and the language can to be as diverse. So we also consider the multilingual granularity uh, in our task. And also we, we also need to make sure that the testing language actually has sufficient monolingual data so we can actually have a a uh, good initialization for training the multilingual models in the pre-training step. And also we want this uh, task to be as accessible to uh, all the, the people as possible. Um, and next, we also consider how to select the language that we want to test based on our benchmark. So we consider two factors. The first one is the data availability, and the second one is the language diversity. So for data availability, we try to use the number of Wikipedia articles as a proxy for the number of uh, available data on the web. And we select 40 languages out of uh, top 100 languages uh, within, uh, with most Wikipedia articles. So the figure on the right here shows the number of articles uh, available in Wikipedia. And we know that a vast majority of the data are actually uh, in English and also in some uh, Indo-European languages. While there is a long tail for some low resource language or some underrepresented uh, languages. So we also care about the language diversity. Uh, we, we want to pick 14 language families from each group of the uh, each group of the our selected language, and we also our language actually covers 12 written scripts, and it's actually well represented the most popular language uh, in the world. So when we're trying to evaluate the model, we have the following step here. So as I mentioned. We first pre-train the multilingual models on some monolingual data without any labels. And in the second step, we're trying to use the pre-trained model to, to fine-tune on some task specific English annotated data. And then later, we want to ask the model to make the prediction in other languages other than English. The advantage of this uh, setup is that it's computational efficient. Uh, one model only needs to be fine-tuned on English, 
and can be evaluated directly on other languages. For example, here in this task, we fine tune the model on a, a, a binary classification task, trying to a review uh, prediction task, trying to predict whether the review comment is positive or negative. And based on uh, the setup, we also want to evaluate a lot of multilingual models. So we have several baselines and which include popular pre-trained uh, pre pre -trained models. For example, the multilingual BERT model and the uh, machine translation encoders that train on parallel data and also some other uh, trans translation language modeling models. For example, they train on uh, this XLM 15, they are trained on parallel data using a translation uh, language model objective. And the XLMR model is the big models that train on common crow uh, data set. And we also want to test the uh, benefits of having a translation models by testing the translation train, translation text baseline. So for the translation train, basically we can translate all the, translate the English annotated data to other languages and concatenate all of this uh, synthetic data as our fine tuning data set. For the translate test data uh, baseline, we actually translate the test data in other languages to English, and then apply a fine-tuned English model to test on such, um, such uh, translated data. So these two baselines are actually quite commonly used in most of the multilingual uh, research. So this is to more or less simulate, the, to try to find out whether a, a translation model can be benefit to provide a good image, a uh, good result with now cross-lingual transfer. So based on the results, we find that for some of the sentence classification tasks, if we directly transfer the knowledge to other languages, the results are pretty good, and the for accuracy score are actually clustered in a small range. While if you transfer the knowledge from English to the other language for some structural prediction task, uh, you will see that there is a widespread of the performance. So it means that for such fine-grained tasks that require the fine-grained representation at one level, it's much harder to transfer such information. And we also try to take a look at the performance on the uh, language family. And we also find that because we know that the pre-training data contains a lot of English, um, English text, and the model are pre-trained multiple, many times more than the other languages on English. So we know that the, mm, there is a high performance on Indo-European languages here. While if you take a look at some underrepresented languages, you can see that for some languages that are far away from English, the performance uh, drops significantly. And this is particularly true for some language that is quite different from uh, the higher resource language. And part of, and also part of the reason for this uh, gap is also based on, it's also due to the tokenization and underrepresentation of such uh, vocabulary. So for example, if you have lots of data in English and you have relative small amounts of data in other languages, you, when you're trying to construct the vocabulary, lots of vocabularies are actually dominated by English words. And in that case, if you learn the multilingual models, the models might not 
uh, the models might not well uh, uh, capture the enough uh, knowledge from the uh, from the raw text based on relatively small amounts of the vocabulary. And we also split the performance, analyze the performance on based on the language script. So we found that the XLM Robota performed much better on data in Latin script than the other script like Chinese or Japanese. And so this this is also hard this shows that it's also hard to transfer between fifteen script, especially for uh sequence packing tasks. And we're also interested in analyze whether the resource of the data in the other language might play an uh, important factor when we uh, train such a single model. So we analyze the number of uh, Wikipedia documents with respect to the score that we have for each task. And we found that there is a higher correlation with the amount of retraining data for most of the tasks. And, but there is a, a relatively low correlation for the structure prediction task. This means that for most of the tasks that require a, 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 a raw representation, a coarse representation at the sentence level, if you have more and more pre-training data, the model may benefit from having such data. But for some of the tasks that require some fine-grained word level token uh, information, uh, adding more adding more data might just play a less effective role in this uh, in this setting. And we know that there so this also opens some uh, future research for how to incorporate the structure knowledge to enhance the structure prediction task for such a uh, well, single transfer learning task. We also translate the English test set into other languages because for some of the language, they may not have the testing data. So we want to provide such uh, testing data by uh, by the Google Translation API so that we can try to uh, have a um, rough estimation of how well this transfer learning works on the missing languages. And we also test the translation performance on the language that we actually have the uh, human translation. And we also perform the prediction on both the uh, pseudo translation data set and the real human translation data set. And we also found that there is actually, the performance actually very close. This indicates that actually we can try to, we can use the translation uh, pseudo data set as a proxy to get an understanding of how well this translation to some, this transfer learning to the other missing languages. And we also release our uh, uh, benchmark and open for and it's open for submission. We also release our code to uh, facilitate the future uh, future development on this task. So the takeaway for the first part is we actually propose the extreme benchmark that evaluates the cross single generalization ability at different aspects. And we also propose a zero-shot cross-single analysis on eight tasks covering 40 languages. And we also create some pseudo test sets for some missing language. And we release all the codes and the leaderboard here. Um, I would try to maybe get uh, briefly mention the second part and the third part, and we will come to the QA section. Uh, so for the second part here, we, we want to uh, understand how can we improve the multilingual models using alignment information. 
So first of all, as we know that in the very beginning I mentioned, the, this multilingual models are actually pre-trained on a lot of monolingual data using mass language modeling objective. And we also want to test the scenario well, if we have some parallel data, how can we utilize such uh, parallel data to enhance the cross-single uh, learning representation? So this parallel data are generally available for machine learning translation, machine translation research. And in this work, we propose two explicit objectives to align the cross-single contextualized representation at the foot level and also at the sentence level using this parallel data. So first of all, let me try to uh, give an illustration of the intuition behind the word level alignment. So we know that for crossing goal transfer, trans, uh, transformer models, there is a self-attention and self-attention is a uh, and cross-lingual attention as well. So cross-lingual attention is pretty useful for machine translation research. So attention-based model has uh, shown great uh, success over statistical machine translation model. And the key component for such machine translation model is the cross-lingual uh, attention. So to so motivate from this, uh, this uh, that we try to uh, model the attention over the parallel sentence. So here in the, the in the last figure here, we have the source sentence highlighted in blue, and we have the target sentence highlighted uh, in yellow. So for crossing goal attention, for example, in the second source word here, we want to attend to the, so the target word, try to find which target word is most uh, useful to predict the current second word here. And we also want to leverage their preceding token to get a, a partial idea about the source sentence. So here we use the attention mask to control the mask, the controls the uh, access to the certain words in the sequence. So basically, we, we're trying to get the attention matrix from the source sentence to the target sentence. And we're also trying to get the, do the similar stuff to get the attention from the target sentence to the source sentence. So we were trying to get the, the attention matrix on the top of the transformer models. And after we get this two attention matrix, we want to encourage the consistency between these two cross-single attention matrix. So we, we're trying to minimize the distance between these two matrices. And here is uh, our objective for the cross-single alignment. So we know that based on the previous slides, we know that these two matrix are actually a tension matrix, and the score in this matrix are actually normalized between zero and one. So if we if we get the trace between the product of these two matrices, this value is actually bounded by the is upper bounded by the minimum length of the source sentence or the uh, target sentence. So, and the upper bound is achieved by, uh, in the case, the upper bound is achieved when these two attention matrix are actually identical. So if we trying to optimize this equation, actually we are encourage, encouraging the uh, two attention matrix to be as similar as possible in our optimization process. And for the sentence alignment, we actually want to encourage a model to predict whether the, uh, a given 
for a given four sentence, what is the correct translation within, what's the correct translation of this sentence within a mini batch of candidate sentences. So, so here we also use the transformer models, but we encode the source sentence and the target sentence separately and get the sentence space, sentence representation of the source sentence and the target sentence on the top of the transformer layer. And then we try to use the negative contrastive floors to predict if what's the correct translation of the source sentence. So we use this uh, negative both likelihood uh, objective to minimize uh, to minimize this loss. So the so there are some details about this uh, some this uh, objective, and I I would leave this to the papers. But let's take a look at the results. So let's look at take a look at the sentence retrieval results. When we're trying to retrieve a sentence based on, uh, re for example, this task requires us to retrieve the translation of a given English sentence. And we know that here is the existing, the performance of the existing model. And I highlight uh, the models in blue for those trained on monolingual data only. And the, and the purple one and the orange one are the models that train on parallel data. So we know that if you train on parallel data, the model, the existing XLM15 actually outperforms the other existing models. But if you use our models, if you use our sentence alignment objective, our and also we train the multilingual bird model by ourselves. And our multilingual bird and bird model is actually better than the uh, publicly available and bird uh, checkpoint. And we also compare our model that train on parallel data with the existing model that also train on parallel data. And we also find that uh, adding the sentence alignment model, our our models actually better than the existing model here, which indicates that the sentence alignment is quite effective to uh, improve the sentence level task, such as uh, sentence retrieval task. We also want to have uh, um, so this is so this is actually typo. Uh, this is the, the uh, POS task. So we, we, we also further test on the POS tagging task here. So for, for the existing model, we see that the model trained on parallel data actually can outperform the MBERT model. Uh, and our, this is also consistent with our findings actually our translation language model objective can actually help help to improve over the multilingual language objective only. And if you take a look at the word level, um, word level alignment, the second bar here is the is our model that train with our word alignment objective, and the third bar is the uh, model that we train with all the objectives that we mentioned. We found that our model actually outperforms the translation language model objective here. So here is a takeaway for this work. Um, our, our work proposed two explicit uh, alignment objectives. And one is particularly focused on word level alignment, and the other is particularly focused on sentence level alignment. And we also showed that using a small size of monoling multilingual models that train with uh, just a small amount of parallel data can beat the large models that train with much more monolingual data.
Um, yeah, next I will briefly just mention uh, some application to multilingual transfer learning. So we know that uh, currently we are in the COVID-19 pandemic and we want to share the knowledge as much as possible. But lots of COVID-19 related text is mostly written in some major languages such as uh, English or Chinese. And we want to use the current state-of-the-art machine translation system to translate such tests in multiple other languages. For example, the language in Africa. And um, we know that this area might suffer a lot, a bit more than the other areas for the COVID-19. Uh, and we, we want to um, share the knowledge as much as possible. But if you directly apply the machine learning machine translation models to translate to such text, we know that there is a significant domain shift between the text in COVID-19 domain and in the training data that we use to train such uh, MT system. So to better if evaluate the performance on this uh, translation performance, we try to release the parallel data for COVID-19 domain. And this covers 21 high priority languages, in particular languages such as uh, African, South, in, in South Africa, uh, in Africa and South Asia and Southeast Asia. And many, so all of these languages are manually translated into many other languages so that we can train the system to translate from or to any of the languages. This is um, this is beneficial for multilingual neural machine translation where we we can translate many to in the many to many setting or one to many, many to one setting. And this is a joint work with a bunch of uh, uh, industry companies and also uh, academic institutes. And our collected data cover a wide range of topical domains such as uh, medical, conversational, and uh, general domains. And here is several uh, examples about the data set. And we know that some of the words here are actually quite domain specific. For example, this bias reproductive numbers and such uh, such domain specific. So if you directly apply the machine translation model to translate such sentence, some of the words is rarely happened in it's rarely occurred in the general domain. So the translation performance on such uh, data would be really cool. And we also find that there, there are the big challenges is not to improve the translation performance on existing data, but the the biggest problem is to uh, improve the translation model on the data that we don't on the language that we don't have publicly available parallel data, especially for some underrepresented languages, for example, Ukrainian or Roma or Dari. And to improve such um, low resource language translation, clearly we need to apply multilingual transfer learning, where we can transfer the knowledge that we learn from higher resource language to low resource language. And to sum up, uh, I we release the the TICO data set to facilitate the translation research in the COVID-19 domain. And this uh, data set covers nine high resource languages, 21 high priority languages, and nine high population languages. And this one, this uh, benchmark is used to encourage the cross-single zero-shot transfer learning for some underrepresented languages. Um, with this, I, um, I'm happy to take the question.
Hi, uh, hi, Junji, can you hear me? Yes, Hello? I can. Yeah. yeah, so thank you for the talk. Very interesting. And, you know, we definitely need diversity in NLP, I mean, in, in NLP right now. And this is a great talk covering transfer learning and how to deal with different languages. So let's go to the uh, QA session. Uh, we have a couple of questions here. I'm going to read them out and then uh, you can answer them accordingly. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so the first uh, question is Jing, from Jing Feng Yang. Uh, why do why do you think pre-trained multilingual models perform well in cross-lingual tasks? For example, there is no alignment of sentences or words in multilingual text when pre-training Emerge or Excel MR. Do you think the models rely on code switching to do alignment in embedding space? Yeah, this is a good question, and this is uh, actually uh, uh, a hot research topic that uh, recently most people are very interested in. So for multilingual, uh, multilingual pre-training, actually, if you, I, I would, this is my opinion and some uh, findings from the other research paper. So they work because they share some uh, model parameters, some model layers. Uh, so if you take a look at the cross-lingual uh, the multilingual models, they are actually using transformers and they share the intermediate trans self attention layer. And these layers are actually quite important. And, and the, the, at the bottom, they have the cross single word embedding. And such word embedding are constructed from, uh, uh, by, by BPE, basically support units. And these support units are actually also important in another aspect. So, for example, some of the language might share some support tokens, especially for for language in European. And we know that, uh, or in the same language family, uh, we know that some of the words are actually close to each other, and they might share similar structure or similar word order. So. When you have similar uh, words uh, embedding, for example, if a uh, language has fair, uh, relatively low resources, and but it has a, a, a another language that is uh, that has a lot of much much larger data set for training the multilingual models in the pre-training set, then the the pre-training can benefit the transfer for such low resource language even in the data set they don't have many language at all. And the other factor is that when you jointly train such models, the the transformer actually is trying to find a is trying to find a interlingual space. For example, if you uh, go from the bottom to top and you actually extract the top representation, you know that the transformer model can be used as a function projector, trying to project the language to a, a space as close as possible, so that in that space they can perform uh, the same task of mass lingual language prediction. Yeah, I think this um, this might more or less uh, answer the question. Mm -hmm. um. Uh, let's go to the next question. Uh, do you have any ideas on increasing the generalizability, uh, cross-lingual structural information transfer if tested languages have significantly different structures compared to English? Okay, yes, that's a, this is also a good question. So there is several ongoing work trying to encourage the vectorization of language representation. So, the idea being that if you want to learn the multilingual representation, you you actually want to factorize the representation into language agnostic representation and language specific not a representation. For the language agnostic representation, it can be helpful to transfer the common uh, information among all the languages, while for the language specific uh, components, they can be used to fully identify the languages themselves. 
and try to encode specific uh, information such as different word order or different uh, grammars. And in that sense, the model can know uh, what the input looks like and how we should encode the language specifically using uh, different different uh, using different strategies. So, for example, if you have a language that are quite different from English, if you just share all the representation together, you actually cannot figure out whether the English can have a negative transfer effect or a positive transfer effect. So, but if you can factorize the representation into the way that I mentioned, then you would have a clear understanding how you might be able to control the sharing and avoid negative transfer. Let's go to the next question. Uh, how did you get the label to match? The, this is from Jiao Chen. Uh, how did you get the label to match the sentences in other languages? Were they generated via translation models or directly from machine translation data sets? Uh, I'm not sure what as, uh, Jiao is mentioned. Maybe Jiao, uh, could you elaborate a little bit? Uh, yeah, Jiao, could, if you could like oh, clarify I, the, yeah. I'm, yes. I'm just thinking, I'm just about asking about the cross-lingual alignment task. So they have like the mm -hmm. word matching and sentence matching. So I'm just curious about how do you get the labels about the sentence matching? Oh yeah, so yeah, I got it. So here in the task, uh, we are actually doing the, um, we are actually using parallel data. So for parallel data, we actually know that which sentence aligns to the other one. So we are actually using supervised training method rather than unsupervised training method. So, so in, if you see here, compared to the previous model, we have the mass single pre-training step, and we don't actually know that which language aligns to the others. But in our settings, we're trying to use parallel data where you actually know that, for example, a French sentence actually aligns to the, its corresponding English translation. So we can use such a supervised signal to guide the training. And we argue that using just a small amount of parallel data can be beneficial to improve the representation. Yeah, okay, I see, thank you. Um, let's go to the next question uh, from Jing Feng Yan. Do you think parameter shared model, including pre-trailed multilingual model, is still a good choice for languages other than Indo-European languages? Because there is a dis large discrepancy between English and those languages, example Chinese. There is nearly no shared subword. Also, syntax is very different. Yes, this is a good question. So, yeah, I think this is also one future direction many people are exploring right now. So especially for some system language, and they actually cannot share much of the vocabulary. But I still believe, I, so I might, this is my impression, I, I think the, the transformer layer is actually quite powerful to capture, to encode the sentence itself. So if you take a look at the crossing goal sentence retrieval task, uh, if you don't require some fine grain information, if and directly use the layer wise representation is very effective to find the the translation, the paraphrase translation. And we we and in that sense um, I would say for some tasks that just only require some forced information at the sentence level. Maybe tr translation model is good enough, and but there is certainly some room to improve. But for some uh, for some tasks like uh, structure prediction that require a lot of uh, fine grain uh, fine grain recent uh, prediction at the word level, we know that the translation the performance is significant worse. So this 
I agree that we also need to improve the transformer layer by, as I mentioned, I believe there's, there should be some certain way that we can, for example, trying to design a component to, to improve the, to factorize the knowledge so that we, we don't mix all the representation in the intermediate layer by the self-attention self-attention Yeah, I think you got a little bit cut in the middle. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, yeah. yeah. Um, so the next question also by Jing Feng Yang. Uh, do you think some other level of shared representations are useful, like explicitly shared grammar? Uh, example, universal dependency instead of learning shared representations from the scratch, especially for those languages other than Indo-European languages. No shared subword. This is a good point, and it's actually it's actually true for some low resource language. Like, uh, for example, people have done a lot of work on incorporate the structure knowledge in the low resource languages, because I I uh, because for such a multilingual model, they are trained on much larger data sets, and for high resource languages. Those uh, those performance are quite good because their representation are learned quite well. But for some low resource language, if you have if you don't have enough data to train the representation well, then some structure bias from uh, like linguistic grammar or some dependency tree, such uh, structure bias might be helpful to find a better way to encode the data. For example, I, I, yeah, this is also my opinion. For example, when you're trying to encode the sentence, you are actually using self-attention to pay attention to certain words in the sentence. And also in, get, try to find the keyword, most relevant word, when you're trying to encode the current sentence. Then if you know the structure, and if you, so in the case for low resource, high resource, the model can learn such uh, the physical patterns based on lots of data, and they can more or less learn the implicit structure. But for high, low resource, if you don't have such data to learn such implicit structure, may, maybe explicit structure like grammar or some dependency link might be helpful to shortcut to get the most correct or most relevant information from the sentence. Um, thanks for the answer. Let's, uh, next question is by Yang Chen. Uh, how should we choose a model checkpoint for a target language? I found the performance of a pre-trained multilingual model varies a lot on the target language. Even their performance on English is quite close. So, do you mean find a checkpoint for pre-training or fine-tuning? Uh, it says, oh, I would, uh, Yangchun, if you could clarify. Uh, so, it doesn't say, it says, like, how should we choose a model checkpoint for a target language? Uh, and I found okay, that before. So, oh, go ahead. Yeah, so, so I, 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 think, I think he might be mentioned, or he might, she or she might be mentioning the fine-tuning step uh, mm -hmm. to choose the checkpoint. So for choosing the checkpoint at the fine-tuning step, we actually use the English development data set to, to test the model every uh, several uh, iterations, and then just try to find a good uh, checkpoint based on the evaluation performance on English. This might not be an optimal solution, but uh, uh, I guess this is uh, one reasonable way to get the get a good checkpoint because uh, for English, oh, let's suppose for zero shot setting, we only have English annotations for our training and evaluation, and in that sense, we we the best we can do is to get the best checkpoint on English data 
with the hope that this uh, this performance can be generalized to the other language. Uh, yeah, he was talking about fine tuning. So yeah, you got the question. Uh -huh. And uh, this is the last question for today. Uh, in XLM, you require parallel data. Those are obtained by translation, human annotation, or automatic machine translation. Uh, data from human annotation are limited, and data from MT are noisy. Do you think those are limitations? Yeah, this is uh, one issue for such a model using uh, parallel data. But uh, we also so in the second part of my talk, I also shows that. So, for example, if you uh, go to the slide here. So, yes, yes. So here you can see that for parallel data, we are actually using 25 gigabytes of the text. But uh, if you take a look at the monolingual data they use for training the XLMR Roberta, they are using 2.5 uh, gigabytes. And you, you actually know that if then our models actually outperform the, trans, uh, the XLM Roberta here by a large margin. So you actually know that if you have relative small amount of parallel data, then this this model can be greatly improved. So in the sense that for some low resource language, we are actually want to test whether there's uh, if we have some extra effort to annotate some parallel data for such low resource languages, can it be helpful to reduce the the training data that we we need to handle, and we actually show that yes, it is. If you can annotate this, maybe uh, one percent of the monolingual, one percent of the parallel data compared to the monolingual data, then the performance can be greatly improved. And that's true for some high, the lower research, uh, low resource languages. We might not have such uh, parallel data, but I think that. Um, this work also points out that uh, parallel data is necessary. I think those are the Q and A's for today. That's a lot of Q and A's. <laughs> I think the talk was really interesting. And um, so thank you, Junji, for taking the time to give us a talk. Uh, yeah, have a good weekend. And okay. everyone else, have a good weekend. Bye. Bye.